Everyone said, my name is, is Ben, very excited to be here. Uh, this is uh, only my second time in Arizona. Uh, the first time was a couple years ago. I came out with my wife, Allie, and you guys had record highs when I was out. Um, it was, if I remember correctly, 184 degrees. Um, <laughs> it was so hot. Uh, my eyeballs felt hot, which was a new experience for me. Um, but this time I flew out a couple days ago, I came prepared. I brought nothing but t-shirts and then it's done nothing but rain and be chilly. So your state confuses me, but I am excited to be here. Um, you're in the middle of this series called The Battle Within, right? That's exactly what it sounds like. It's all about the internal struggles that we face, like mental health issues. You've talked about identity and addiction and stress and burnout. And yes, today we are going to talk about depression and self-harm and suicide. And I know I've done this long enough to know that like you, you hear that and there's not very many people who are like, woohoo, <laughs> like, right? Like I understand that it's kind of heavy stuff, but at the same time, it's worth talking about. Here's why it's worth talking about. So statistically speaking, one out of 12 of us in this room are struggling with depression. On top of that, the people who are struggling with depression, two thirds of us will never seek any help for it. And so it's worth talking about because there's a pretty decent chance that either you struggle with depression or you love and care about someone who's silently suffering from depression. Also, by the end, to end of today, I think you're going to see that there's, this is much more about hope today than it is about hopelessness. I think you're going to see that. Um, I believe that you can talk about depression without being depressing. And I feel like I've earned the right to say that because I've taught a lot on depression. And I've taught a lot on depression because I have it. Right? I'm, I'm the one out of 12. All right? At all times, the 11 people closest to me are mentally safe because I've got it. <laughs> all right? So stick close. <laughs> um, I've got depression. It has challenged my faith. It has burdened my life. At the same time, I love getting to share my story with other people because I've learned that Jesus really is a light in the midst of darkness and he really is hope in the face of hopelessness. And so as crazy as it might sound, I'm genuinely honored and excited to get to talk about depression and how Jesus meets us in depression with you today. At the same time, uh, it's a big topic and we have a limited amount of time. And so when I was studying up, I figured the best way to tackle depression would be to tell you two stories. I'll tell you a bit of the story of my life and I'll tell you a story from the life of a man named Elijah. And we're going to start with Elijah. Okay, uh, the moment I want to look at is in 1 Kings chapter 19, if you've got your Bibles or apps or whatever. Uh, but to, to truly grasp the power of 1 Kings 19, you and I have to have a pretty good understanding of what happened in the chapter right before it, in, in chapter 18. And so what I'm going to do right now is try, I'm going to try to quickly breeze through and summarize 1 Kings 18 so that we can dig into chapter 19. Okay, and 1 Kings 18 starts like this says, after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and God said, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I'll send rain on the land. And so Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Okay, let's kind of make sure we have our key players in order here for the next couple chapters. First, we've got Elijah. All right, Elijah is a prophet. He was like a messenger for God. God would share messages to his prophets who would then share them with the Israelites. That's Elijah, prophet. Uh, God tells Elijah to go and visit Ahab. Ahab at the time was the king of Israel. And we learn from 1 Kings chapter 16 that he, quote, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And he, quote, did more to provoke the Lord to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. So in other words, King Ahab is a bad dude. He's a wicked, wicked king. So we got Elijah, we got Ahab. Chief among Ahab's sins is that he married a woman named Jezebel, okay? Jezebel was just as evil as, if not more evil than King Ahab. She worshiped the pagan god Baal. She convinced Ahab and the rest of Israel to worship him too. So Ahab built like a temple and altars to Baal in Israel, which is a huge no-no. And those are kind of our, our four key players for these new, next two chapters. We got God and Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel. And God, the hero, the main character, tells Elijah, the prophet, to go and visit Ahab, the wicked king, because he has a message that's going to bring the Israelites away from pagan worship and back to the heart of God so that he can send rain on the land and alleviate a drought. 
Boom. It's like that's our, our context. What happens in the rest of uh, 1 Kings 18 is fantastic. You should absolutely read it later today. It's awesome. Parts of it are hilarious. Um, I'll have to just summarize it for you now, but Elijah meets up with Ahab and Elijah goes, hey, why don't you and all your pagan prophets come meet me up on Mount Carmel, which is awesome. This is like the Old Testament version of like, meet me in the parking lot after school. Like he wants to have a fight. And they do basically, like they all gather up on Mount Carmel and they have a prophet duel. And so here's what that looks like. The, the prophets of Baal set up their own altar and Elijah sets up his own altar. And then Elijah says that the true God of Israel will reveal himself by setting one of these altars on fire. So he lets the prophets of Baal go first. They beg and, and plead and pray with Baal, please light this altar on fire and reveal yourself as the true God. They do this all morning, nothing happens. After a lunch break, Elijah's like, okay, my turn. He goes to his altar. He douses it three times in water just to show that there's no like David Copperfield <laughs> magic trick going on. And then he prays to Yahweh, the God of Israel, and immediately fire falls from the sky and ignites his altar. And the result is that the people of Israel repent and they turn back to God and King Ahab is humiliated and the Israelites rise up and slay all of the pagan prophets and then God alleviates the drought by sending rain. Boom, victory, right? Elijah should be on cloud nine. And yet, that's not what we're gonna see with Elijah. And this is where we finally get to start digging into 1 Kings chapter 19, which starts like this. Now Ahab told his wife Jezebel everything Elijah had done up on Mount Carmel and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like that of one of the prophets that you killed. Little more context, um, Jezebel at this time had been systematically rooting out and murdering all of God's prophets. Like the ones who were alive were all in hiding. They were hiding in caves. Like images of the Nazis in Poland come to mind. It was like, a, it was a very dangerous time to be one of God's prophets. And now Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah to say, I'm going to kill you before sunset tomorrow. And this is her reputation. Now remember, this comes on the heels of an incredible moment in Elijah's life, okay? This is the following day. Like, he was just up on Mount Carmel. He just got to witness God's power and provision and protection in a big way. And you and I like to think that if we were in Elijah's shoes, there would be nothing to test or challenge our faith right now, right? Because we just saw God and we saw he's powerful. We saw it before our very eyes and he's on our side. And yet Jezebel sends this messenger who says to Elijah, you're a dead man. And how does Elijah respond? Next verse, Elijah, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a whole other day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush. He sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. And here's part of his prayer. He says, I've had enough, Lord. Like, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. How does Elijah respond to Jezebel's threat? He runs, he hides, he collapses under a broom tree, and then depression sets in. And, and some of you might be going like, I don't know, depression, that seems like a bit of a stretch. It's like, I don't know how to more concisely explain what goes on in the head and heart of someone who suffers with depression. It's all the same thoughts that Elijah's having right now. I'm overwhelmed, I can't go on, I'm alone, and I'm better off dead. And so let's, let's pause Elijah's story right now, because... I don't think we do this on purpose, but I think many times unintentionally we mythologize the Bible. What I mean by that is we forget like these are not characters in a fairy tale. These are real people in moments of history. Whenever we forget that, we lose the power of what we're reading. And so I've found whenever studying the Bible, super helpful to pause frequently and try to put yourself in these people's shoes. And for me at least, that's, I mean, that's not hard to do with Elijah. I've been in his shoes. And I've sat under that broom tree and I've prayed that prayer more times than I can count. God, I'm overwhelmed. I can't go on. I'm alone 
and I'm better off dead. And so before we resume Elijah's story, let me tell you a bit of mine. Okay, I, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. Grew up in a, a church-going family. That's not everyone's story, but that's, that's my story. Uh, my parents were really involved in this little church, like, you know, tiny, maybe 100 people on Easter weekend, maybe. My dad was an elder. What that meant is as a kid, I was in this church building and around these same, like, 50, 60 people all of the time, like Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, potluck dinners. My dad would, would take me to elders' meetings with him, and I'd have the building to myself. I'd run around and try to find the box of goldfish so that I could eat a snack. And it was fun as a kid, but then around the age of 13, I started to doubt the faith that I had grown up with. Honestly, I doubted it for a whole slew of reasons that like, my story of doubt is a whole other message for a whole other time. But I started to doubt it when I was 13, and I want to share with you what felt like the final nail in the coffin of my faith, which came my freshman year of college. This was a, a time in my life where I'm, I'm kind of putting puzzle pieces together and I'm starting to notice this trend of deep sadness in my life for as long as I can remember. And I just woke up one morning in my dorm room and I realized like, oh, like I think I have depression. Like I think maybe that's what's been going on my whole entire life. Now, similar to Elijah, this like epiphany of mine it came right on the heels of some pretty significant wins in my life. Like everything on the outside looks great. I'm finally a thousand miles from home. I couldn't wait to get out of Dallas. I'm making great friends. I loved what I was studying. I had met Allie, who I was quickly falling in love with and would eventually marry. Like everything's going great. It's just that I realized that for my entire life, even in the midst of great things, there was always this dark, heavy burden on my shoulders all of the time. And if you have depression, you know what I'm talking about. And the reason that depression felt like the final nail in the coffin of my faith was because in the church that I grew up in, in, in the only Christian context that I knew about, like, oh my gosh, you could not be a Christian with depression, right? Depression was a sin. And depression meant that you lacked faith and you didn't actually trust Jesus. Like, depression and faith in, in the church I grew up in, these two things were absolutely incompatible with one another. If you said you had depression, people tried to, like, talk behind your back and scheme ways to save you. Right? Like maybe he needs rebaptized, or I don't think he went to CIY last year, or maybe he needs an exorcist. Does anybody know any Catholics? Right? Like someone called the Catholics. I said I had depression, and I realized I had depression. And what I immediately told myself was like, well, that's that. Like any any part of me that's holding on to even just a thread of faith, that's gone now. Because I thought that to be a Christian, you can't have depression. And if you have depression, you know that thing tends to linger, right? It doesn't really disappear overnight. And so over the next decade, depression just sunk its claws into me. My hopelessness grew and grew because I was one of the two-thirds. I told no one. I didn't even tell my wife. It's like I'm up in my head trying to fix myself on my own power. And so things got dark very quickly for me. Just like Elijah, I used to hope that my life would end. Now I had a lot to live for. Like the absolute darkest moments of my depression, that stretched into me being married and having my beautiful daughter in my home and having my son on the way. Like I had a lot to live for and I didn't want to live. And then in my absolute darkest moments, I had decided that if fate wasn't going to take care of things, then that must mean I'm going to have to take matters into my own hands. And I started dipping my toes in the dark, dark waters of self-harm, which of course was me testing the waters of ending my own life. And I, I know there's some people in here who cannot imagine that. Now, I've, I've been around people when they hear about suicide and they go, oh, that's so selfish. That's so stupid. How could they do that? I, I would just tell you that you don't understand. And I thank God, I'm thankful you don't understand, but maybe be gracious to the people who are suffering with this because you don't understand. I don't think you realize how dark it can get for some of us. 
I don't think you realize that the lies that we tell ourselves become so believable. And so you end up really convincing yourself. You truly start to believe that, that like your loved ones would be better off without you. You start to convince yourself that suicide could be a selfless act that's going to help the pe people you love more than it is going to hurt them. It's lies. And ultimately, all these lies, they stem from the biggest lie that depression tells a person, which actually isn't that life is sad. <laughs> We're not stupid. Everyone knows life can be sad. Instead, the biggest lie that depression tells a person is that life is impossible. And so suicide begins to look like a solution to an impossible problem for some of us. And I bring all that up just because I, I, I want you to hear that if you've ever had those thoughts or if you have those thoughts right now, I want you to hear there's at least one pastor out here who doesn't think you're crazy. All right, hear me. I think you're being misled. I think you're believing lies. I think that Jesus has a plan for your life that's way better than the plan you're devising in your mind right now. But I don't think you're crazy and I don't think you're stupid because I've been there. Over a decade ago, I was making really good time down a very dark path. And I can tell you in all honesty, I don't believe I would be alive to tell you about it today if it weren't for encountering the real Jesus and his radical grace and compassion. But before I share that part of my story with you, let's check back in on Elijah because we abandoned him. We left him under the broom tree. He prayed for his own death, and then he fell asleep. My question, I think it should be your question too, is how does God meet Elijah in the middle of his depression? Well, let's pick it back up. We're in verse five. All at once, an angel touched Elijah and said, get up and eat. And Elijah looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And so he ate, and he drank, and then he laid down again. And then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, because this journey is just too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. And I love this because we're starting to see how God meets us whenever we are in the middle of suffering. And just so you hear it from me, I want to tell you, I'm not saying that in 2024, if you have depression, all you need to do is pray a little bit harder because then if you do, you'll wake up one morning with an angel at the foot of your bed holding a box of oatmeal cream pies being like, cheer up, pal. I'm not saying that. But in these verses, we do see the heart of God towards those of us who are suffering and we see that he meets us with grace and compassion. And yet for some reason, that's not really what we expected of God. Just be honest. I mean, we kind of expected God to chew Elijah out, right? We kind of think that's what Elijah deserves. We thought he was going to go, Elijah, were you at Mount Carmel yesterday? Did you see what I did through you? I've done powerful things through you, and now you're scared of some two-bit goon named Jezebel. Where's your faith, man? Pull it together, Elijah. That's what we expect God to say. But instead, he meets Elijah with grace and compassion, and we see the tender heart of a loving father whose first response is not to chastise. It's not even to problem solve. Instead, his first response is to go, Elijah, buddy, let's get some food and let's get some sleep because this journey has been too much for you. He meets Elijah with grace and compassion. And so Elijah has a couple snacks and he has a couple naps. And then after that, here's what happens. It says, strengthened by that food, Elijah traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, and there he went into a cave and spent the night. And now we're getting to the part of the story that personally I love the most because it's so raw and it's so real. And, and what I mean by that is, again, if this were a fairy tale, well, then when the character meets an angel or when, you know, when they meet the fairy godmother, the problem is solved right? Their spirits are lifted. That's not what we're about to see with Elijah because this is not a fairy tale. Instead, look, he's in this cave on Mount Horeb. Here's what happens next. It says, the word of the Lord came to him and God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. Like I've poured all of my heart into this thing for you and yet still the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, they've put your prophets to death with the sword, I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. 
Elijah is still in a dark place. God asks him, how you doing, Elijah? And, and not much has changed in the last 40 days. His response is essentially the same. He goes, God, I'm still overwhelmed and I can't go on and I'm alone and I'm better off dead. To summarize the next few verses for the sake of time, God says to Elijah, he's like, hey, come out of that cave because I'm gonna allow my presence to pass before you. So Elijah comes out of the cave and this big wind gusts across the mountain, but God's not in the wind. And then a big earthquake rattles the ridge, but God's not in the earthquake. And then a fire descends on the peak, but God's not in the fire. And then only after all of these displays of power, it does a gentle whisper rustle through the valley. And it's not until Elijah hears that whisper that he hides his face at the awesome glory and power of God contained in a gentle whisper. And then in verse 13, God asks Elijah a second time. He goes, okay, now... Elijah, what are you doing here? And after being personally fed and tended to by an angel of the Lord, and after being rocked by the glory of God contained in a gentle whisper, when he's asked that question a second time, here's how Elijah responds. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. And the Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars and put your prophets to death. And now they're trying to kill me too. I mean, his response hasn't changed one bit. His response hasn't changed by one word. And it's supposed to make us feel uncomfortable. It's supposed to. We're supposed to be going like, Elijah, like God's gone kind of out of his way to cheer you up, buddy. Like it's time to pull it together. But he can't. He just can't pull it together right now. So to summarize the end of the story, after responding the same way a second time, God gives Elijah just a little bit of clarity, I mean, like just a little bit of direction, just enough to get him back up on his own two feet and moving again under the burden of depression. The end. And I'm so, so thankful for this story because it's so true to real life and it's true to real faith, or at least it's true to how God has met me in the face of my depression. So to go back to my story, I, I told you I was on this path that I really think, I, I don't think I would have survived it if I didn't meet the real Jesus. And here's how that happened. Okay, I met my wife in Tennessee. We got married out in Tennessee. Shortly after that, we move out to Colorado. I got a degree in English. I was gonna go into the publishing world. I was working at a magazine. I hated it. My depression, meanwhile, I still hadn't told anyone and it was spiraling out of control. And in this dark season of life, my wife, Allie, is like, I wanna start going to church again. And I'm basically like, what the heck? You know, I don't believe in any of this stuff, but I'll go with you because I don't think it could hurt right now. So I start going to this church, and for the first time in my life, I heard pastors who were broken, and they just admitted it. And I heard pastors who were honest about how Jesus has a lot of work to do in their lives, and they were committed to letting Jesus do the work. And I found a community of people who believed the same thing. Like, basically, I found a community of people who understood that the story of Jesus' grace is a story that can only be told through your own brokenness. And it was so refreshing and so exciting and so contagious. So I start reading the Bible again for the first time in a, forever, and I'm reading it through a new lens. I'm reading it through the lens of grace, and that's when I stumbled upon 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and God started to change my life. And I want to share this verse with you. Okay, this is the Apostle Paul writing. And right before this verse, he says he has a thorn in his flesh, which is a metaphor. He's, he's got like something in his life that's causing him suffering and pain. He's super honest. He says that he's been begging and pleading with Jesus to take this thorn away, to take this suffering away. And then in verse 9, Jesus finally responds to Paul's begging and pleading. And we know what we, we, know what we want Jesus to say, right? We want him to go, oh, Paul, of course, Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I was just got distracted. I got busy. Of course, you've been such a faithful servant. I'll take away your thorn. That's what we want Jesus to say. What does he say instead? Look at this. Paul says, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
See, we want Jesus to say, of course, Paul, I can do all things. I'll take away your thorn. I'll take away your suffering. That's what we want him to say. What does he say instead? Paul is begging and pleading with Jesus, please remove my suffering. And Jesus replies, no. No, but. No, but my grace is sufficient for you, which means I I won't take it away, but I also won't let it crush you. And actually, Paul, my power is made perfect through your thorn. And Jesus started to and continues to radically change my life through those words of his. Anytime I, I hear those words, I'm reminded that when Jesus looks at my mess, when he looks at my pain and my suffering and my baggage, and when he sees my depression, he doesn't look at me and go, hey, get your act together. Instead, he looks at me and he says, I can work with that, so give it to me. That clicked with me like a a decade ago. And and once that clicked, it was like all this other beautiful stuff about Jesus started to click. I was like, I don't, I actually don't think he's asking me to be perfect. I think that was just my old church that wanted perfection out of me. In fact, I think he was perfect on my behalf. And I started to realize like, I don't think he's telling me to earn his grace. I think he's commanding me to receive it. And eventually I, I decided, I really think through Jesus, I might be able to be forgiven and redeemed and restored into a relationship with God. And so slowly but surely, because old habits die really hard, I became honest and vulnerable. I took my thorn and I brought it out into the open, out into the light with myself, with people I trusted, eventually with Jesus. And then one day I handed Jesus my whole life and I I had to hand him my depression too. And I asked him like, can you even work with stuff like this? And his answer was, of course I can. Like Ben, Ben, my power is made perfect through stuff like this. And this is where I want to be really clear with you. Okay, I got a lot of pet peeves with church, which is weird because I'm a pastor. Um, But one of my pet peeves is there's a lot of churches, there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people who do the job I'm doing right now. They love stories that wrap up all neat and tidy with a pretty little bow at the end, right? Like I gave my life to Jesus and then I was healed. That's not my story. Okay, my story is like Elijah's and my story is like Paul's. And so please hear me. You fast forward from that season of life where things about Jesus are finally clicking for the first time. Fast forward over a decade from that moment to today. Here's the million dollar question. Did Jesus take away my depression? Here's the answer. Uh Uh-uh. Here's the follow-up question. Do I still feel trapped in hopelessness? Do I still feel ready to die? And the answer to that question is no. Why? Guys, I don't know what to tell you other than his grace has been sufficient for me. It's been enough. And I want to be clear, like, this isn't magic. Faith isn't a magic trick. You know, like, I've learned a lot. I learned learned some stuff over the last decade, like, I've learned how to carry my depression, not necessarily better, but just like differently. It's like I got the backpack to fit a little bit better. Um, I've seen a lot of counseling, a lot of therapy. I've got medication that I'm on. My family says that uh, Jesus is taking care of us through uh, people, prayer, and pills, which is true. Um, But I'll be honest with you, I still pray every single day for God to heal me of clinical depression. It's just that so far his answer has been no. His answer has been no, but watch this. And then I watch. As crazy as it sounds, I watch as he takes the curse of depression and uses it to bless me and bless other people in my life. I mean, like, my depression, like, it makes me utterly dependent on Jesus. I'd be that way no matter what. I don't think I'd feel that way without depression. Uh, Depression makes me passionate about sharing the gospel. I could run through a brick wall to do exactly what I'm doing right now. My depression has made me empathetic with other people who suffer. It's made me thankful for the good gifts that I do have. Like, Jesus hasn't taken away my depression, but at the same time, ever since I offered it to him, he hasn't wasted it either. And and I'm not thankful for my depression. That would be sick and twisted. But I am thankful for the ways that he's leveraged it for his kingdom and his glory and his power. Like, I mean, for real, his grace has been enough for me. And I'm not the only person who can stand here and and tell you that his grace has been sufficient for me. And so before I kind of wrap up today, let's hear one more story from someone who calls Central home. 
I wound up coming into Central because my husband and I were church shopping. Well, we were engaged at the time. Oh, I have met so many new people within the Central Christian community. It, it has been amazing. And just becoming closer, and they are helping me to get to where I need to be as well. God is using them in my life, and he's using me in their life as well. I have hidden my mental health from everybody all my life. I have hidden my suicide attempts from everyone. Nobody knew anything about my mental health. I have anxiety, depression, um, and I just want others to know that you're not alone. You don't have to be afraid to step out. This needs to be spoken of, and I believe God is, is calling me out to talk about mental health and suicide prevention and awareness because so many people feel alone in it, and you don't have to. It's just a matter of just loving on people because that's where God wants you to be. He wants you to be with people. He wants you in community. He wants you to be honest. God is gonna fill your life. He's gonna move you to do more and more, and you're gonna have a deeper relationship with Him. Oh, my biggest challenge was afraid that people would think I am crazy and that they wouldn't want to know me or get to know me or be my friend. But I have more friends now than, than I've ever had in my life that God had brought into my life. I had the semicolon and the central Christian cross on each side of one of the first scars um, when I attempted suicide for the first time. So what I did was from the semicolon through the lines of my scars to the cross, my story is an over. And this reminds me that God is not done with me. I'm gonna be here to do whatever he calls me to do. Yeah, give it up for Michelle. Mm. Listen, my, my story is the same as Michelle's. We got the same story as Paul. We got the same story as Elijah. Honestly, it's, it's still, it's a story that people like us are going to shout from the rooftops till the day we die. Because my story is that I'm still a mess. It's just that I'm a mess that Jesus loves. I'm a mess that he's committed to fixing. I'm a mess that he's forgiven. I'm a mess that he's redeemed and called a son of God. Like the only story that I ever have to share as a pastor from a pulpit is if Jesus can truly love and forgive a mess like me, dude, he can love and forgive a mess like you. And if Jesus can truly work through a mess like mine, no problem. He can work through a mess like yours. Central, I'm, I'm basically here as a friend from across the country to encourage you again with the gospel of grace. Because right? the gospel is not that you need to be perfect on your own power. I don't know what that is. It's not the gospel. The gospel is that you need to be forgiven by God's power, and you have been. The gospel is that Jesus loves you like he loves Paul, like he loves Elijah, like he loves me, like he loves you in the middle of all of your mess and brokenness. And, and the gospel at work in your life is not a story that goes like this. Ever since I met Jesus, my whole life became spiffy, clean, and perfect. No, that's a lie. The gospel at work in your life is a story that goes like this. I am a total mess, but I have met the one who is not. His name is Jesus. I believe he's the Christ. I believe he's the Messiah. Even though I don't know how he's gonna do it, I believe he'll show off power through my weakness. And even though I don't know how he's gonna do it, I believe he's gonna finish a good work he started in me. That is the hope of the gospel, period. And yet there's, there's so many of us, and I've been there. But we've been so programmed, right, by years and years of religious add-ons and legalism and perfectionism and the attempt to earn your own grace. We've had so much time getting our minds and hearts shaped by that. And so we're sitting here today and we're, and we're going, so wait a minute, are you saying and is Paul saying and is Elijah's story teaching us that you can have a daily struggle with the sinful nature at work in your life and you can even lose that struggle many days, even most days, and still be a child of God? Is that what you're saying? It's like, guys, yes. What did you think the hope of the gospel, what did you think Jesus died for? And so if you're carrying depression, at this point, for any of us who have a thorn, you've got something in your life that's caused you suffering and pain, you've asked Jesus to take it away, and he hasn't. If you've got a thorn, my encouragement to you from personal experience is bring that thing out into the light. 
Do not keep that foreign a secret. You got to bring it out into the open for, for two reasons, okay? First of all, if you keep your thorn a secret, it will crush you. That's not the question. The question is when. It will crush you. This is what's so heartbreaking about self-harm and suicide. Think about the people that you love that you've lost to suicide. What do you tell yourself? You go, oh, I didn't see it coming. If I kept going down the path I was going down, that's what I would have forced my wife and children to say, oh, we didn't see it coming. I've been on the other side too with my really good friend and his teenage daughter. I was a student pastor and on a Sunday, I baptized her. I held her hands in the back of her head and I baptized her. And in that same week, I did her graveside service. We all said the same thing. We didn't see that coming because that poor girl kept her thorn a secret. Do not keep your thorn a secret. It will crush you. The second reason we bring our thorns out into the open is because secrecy is not fitting for the children of God. Like the sons and daughters of the living God, we don't hide our weaknesses. We bring them out into the open so that Christ's power may rest on us. Like that's a big piece of what it means to be the church. Like this community here called Central Christian Church, what, what, you're not supposed to be playing hide and seek. You're supposed to be doing show and tell. Why? Because we're Jesus followers. This is not a self-help perfectionism country club. We are Jesus followers. And so we believe his promise when he says, his power is made perfect, not through our perfections, but through our weaknesses. Bring your thorns and your weaknesses out into the open so that the power of Christ may rest on you. If you do that often enough, I 100% believe that you will experience what I've experienced and what Elijah's experienced. I believe you'll begin to hear the gentle whisper of your God giving you exactly what you need, which is enough grace and compassion to at least make it through the rest of today. If you bring your thorns out into the open, I believe you'll experience what Paul has, what I've experienced. I believe that you'll have a moment where you get to sit back and watch God do powerful things through your brokenness. And if you bring your thorn out into the open often enough, then maybe one day you and I can make Paul's words our own and declare in confidence and say, I will boast all the more gladly. I'll brag all the more joyfully about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And this is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. Why? For because somehow when I'm weak, is when I'm strong. Central, God might not ever take your thorn away, but I can promise you if you offer it to him, he won't waste it. So bring your weakness into the light that Christ's power may rest on you so that you can hear the gentle whisper of your loving father who's assuring you that yes, his grace is sufficient even for you. Let me pray over us. God, I love you so much. I'm so thankful for you. I, I wouldn't, I mean, I would not be here today without you. God, there's a lot of us in this room that we've got um, some skeletons in the closet. We've got secrets that we've kept. We've got pain that we've, we've hidden in the shadows and we're trying to fix ourselves on our own power. And, and, but right now we're hearing this and we're going like, maybe I'll just tell someone about this instead. Maybe I'll bring my thorn out to the open. God, we still got a lot of time before that happens. Like we, we still got the rest of today and we're gonna go say hi to people in the lobby. We're gonna go jump in our car and drive home. We gotta figure out lunch. That's a lot of time for us to lose our courage. So for the people who are on the edge of vulnerability and honesty. God, would you give us courage that's outside of ourselves to bring our thorns out into the open so that we may be healed and so that your power may rest on us. And then God, I have prayed this more times than I can count. I pray that you testify right now. Your, your, Bible, your Bible, your word tells us that it's your spirit that testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And so what that means is anytime we hear that little voice in our ears that's saying, yeah, yeah, this Jesus stuff is great and it's true for most of these people, but not me. I'm too far gone. I'm too broken. I've done way too many messy things. You know, we're told that that's not the voice of your spirit. 
Your spirit convicts us, but, but never by lying to us. Instead, it's your spirit who testifies with our spirit and whispers in our ear and says, hey, even after a day like today, you're still my son, you're still my daughter. And I truly believe there's no sermon powerful enough or, or, or worship song beautiful enough to teach our hearts that. So I ask that you teach our hearts that yes, we are your children. And even on our worst of days, yes, your grace is still sufficient. God, I love you so much. And I pray this in your name, in the, son, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.